Welcome to AP Biology. Today I want to show you some graphs that are uh, that don't follow the rules that I taught you in our last um, video. And then I also want to show you some more complex graphs. So the rules that I showed you from our last video is that you put the independent variable on the x-axis. That's what you know ahead of time. And then you put the dependent variable, or what you measure, um, on the y-axis. And that's the way that we, um, that scientists in general will display data so that it's easy for all scientists to read. Um, this experiment though shows something different. So let's just kind of read through, through the question. Describe the difference between the effect of HLIA overexpression. Ooh, what does that even mean? Overexpression. So I haven't taught you the DNA unit yet, but you know how DNA makes RNA, which makes proteins, right? So if you're making too much of a certain protein, we would say the gene is overexpressed. So the difference between uh, HLIA overexpression on the production of a Calvin cycle enzyme, that's something to do with photosynthesis. We haven't done that unit yet. Don't worry too much about it. And the effect of uh, this thing's overexpression on the concentration of histidine kinase, who is an enzyme, as compared with control cells. So the key shows control cells. So that means this is a control cell, and that's a control cell, and that's a control cell. And then these are the overexpressed ones, right? whoops, uh, over, right? It says cells overexpressing. So the um, darker bars are the overexpressed cells, the cells that overexpress this protein. Okay, here um, where the dependent variable should be, we have relative level per cell. So we're looking at controls versus overexpressed cells, and this shows the production of radiolabeled glucose. This actually doesn't look like an independent variable to me. Um, we're looking at production of radiolabeled glucose, and we're just comparing control versus overexpressed cells, the relative levels of in each. So it's really not an independent variable, dependent variable thing. Um, I think for this experiment, the results, the dependent variables really are um, the radiolabeled glucose or the Calvin cycle or the histidine. And the independent variables, um, I don't know, would be, I guess, um, what you know ahead of time is which cells you're using um, and maybe um, how much of the HLIA protein is overexpressed. So this is just not a normal um, graph. So I guess if you look at a graph and you, it, it, in, the graph just doesn't look like it has an independent variable on the X and a dependent variable on the Y, sometimes there are these weird, um, these weird graphs. And so notice this relative level. Notice how the control is at one and this control is at one, and this control is at one. That's because the amount of histidine kinase, the number of molecules, is gonna be different than the activity of some particular enzyme, which would be different than the number of glucose molecules made. So there's no uh, actual um, unit for this stuff. We're just comparing the overexpressed cells compared to the controlled cells. So that's another just weird thing to look at. So they ask, first of all, what does relative mean? That means, in this case, you're making more uh, radiolabeled glucose in the overexpressed cells than in the control cells, like quite a bit more, right? Um, you're making more um, of, you have more of a Calvin cycle enzyme in the overexpressed cells versus the control cells, like not quite, you know, like about 75%, really, that's a, a lot more. Um, and then you have control versus overexpressed cells, and there is way less um, histidine kinase activity. So that's what relative means. Um, so if you ever see a control that's at one for every single thing, then what you're doing is looking at how much more the experimental is versus the control. Okay, so the way the AP question would, might be worded, it might say something like, tell me the effect of HLI overexpression on the production of a Calvin cycle enzyme compared with a control cell. So here's the Calvin cycle enzymes, and they want you to say it increases by, looks like about uh, 1.75, right? Right here, so about 75% more. And then they ask you about the histidine kinase, and you can see this one is down, so they want you to say a decrease in the overexpressed cells compared to the control. And they say almost 75% there. So there's a range that would be okay with that one. So this graph is uh, not a typical independent variable by dependent variable at all. It's uh, just kind of a wacky graph that is a summary of a bunch of other experiments. Um, 
and it's not actually showing you how the what the results of each individual experiment is. Instead, it's putting a bunch of the experiments together um, to show you control versus um, you know versus the experimental group. Okay, occasionally I have noticed that um, an AP graph will be turned on its side. I've only seen it once. So here's an original graph that I just pulled off of out of Google. Um, and I don't even remember what it's for, but you can see bars of these different things. On um, an AP test question once, I saw the whole thing flipped sideways. So if you see a graph that just looks like it's turned on its side, um, this is so before you would know that normally you've got your independent variable here on the x-axis and your dependent variable on the y. In this case, it's just the x-axis is like, yeah, it's sideways. Um, so if you see like it's turned on its side, um, pull the independent and the dependent with it as you turn it. So this would be your independent variable. And I know it's on the y now, but it's only because the whole graph is sideways. And you can see that because your bars are going sideways. Um, I've, I don't think they would ever do this with, um, with like a scatter plot, but I have seen it once in a bar graph. If you give this to me, I'll mark it wrong. Um, I want it always in uh, this form, but I have seen AP give it in this form once. All right, here's um, another graph um, that is very similar to an AP question that I saw um, where they actually tell you to graph this data and there's actually two independent variables. So how do you deal with that? So these are genetically modified crabgrass stra strains. So crabgrass is grass that grows great in the south, but uh, up here where it's colder, um, it dies in the winter. And so it's uh, the bane of my husband's life. He, he can't stand the crabgrass um, for what that's worth. Okay, so there are three different cultures of this crabgrass. Can you call them cultures? Yeah, maybe not. Um, pigment produced, they all produce chlorophyll A. So I'm actually gonna just ignore this because it's the same in all of them. Cytochrome produced, none. Cytochrome C in culture B and cytochrome B in culture C. I don't even remember if I did that on purpose. It's a little evil. Um, I'm, anyway, I'm gonna consider the culture one of my independent variables. And then what's measured is the density of chloroplast in chloroplast per mil. So here are my results but I've measured them at zero hours and I've measured them at 48 hours. So this is actually also, I decided I'd measure it at zero hours and I decided I'd measure it at 48 hours. So those are independent variables and the culture is an independent variable. All this stuff, this is what I measure. This is the dependent variable. So here's my graph. There are two um, okay ways to do this. Um, I could put culture here because the independent variable should be on the x-axis and I could have culture A, B, and C in whatever order I want. Because these are categories that could go in whatever order, I'm gonna make this a bar graph. And then I could do uh, density of chloroplast. That's what I'm measuring, my dependent variable. So density of chloroplast here, I'm gonna put my uni units, which are gonna be chloroplast per mil, it looks like. And then it goes from, let's see, 9.8 to 22. Two, so I might actually start here at 0, 10, 20, 30. I guess it's as high as it goes, right? Um, so culture A at 0 hours goes up to 22. That's about right here. I'm doing kind of a bad job not spreading this out. Uh, and then 15, what is this? Wait a minute, 10, what did I call this? 0, you know what, let me call it 5, ooh, 5, 10, 15, 20. Let me do it like that, 25. 30. I like that better. Okay, so 22 is going to be about here. So I'm going to call this, let's color this in. So I'm going to say colored in is going to be time equals zero hours. And then 15.3 would be like here-ish or so. So I'm going to say the one that's not colored in is going to be T equals 48 hours. 48 hours. So this is an independent variable and this is an independent variable. And then I can have culture, oh my God, culture B 29. So that's going to be about here, 29 and 29. Oh, it's the same for both of them. So I'm going to draw my two bars like this and this one's going to be colored in. And then I don't know why it doesn't let me do that. Okay. Um, I think I keep pressing a button on my pen. Okay. C is 12.4. So that's like here or so. And then 9.8 would be about here. I'm going to color this one in. So that's one way um, that you can make your um, graph when you have two independent variables. Um, some of my students instead put time here. 
and um, they would have to, of course, put density um, of chloroplasts over here. Make sure you put chloroplasts per mil. Okay. Um, so again, we'll do like 5, 10, so 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Do this up. Okay, so they have time is zero and time is 48. And so they could have A at 22. And I'm going to, oh my God, I'm just going to make a little A here. And then at 15.3, so that's like here. And then B is 29, so that's like this. B and B. And then it would be 12.4 and 9.8 for C. So it's like here and here. And um, so you can do them as dots. You can do them as bars. Some of them actually connected the dots, which I don't know. I mean, it, this is an OK way to do it. Um, if you're doing like um, maybe you're doing squares, like instead of the Bs, you might do like a little square and you'd have a key. Oh, dear. And so that you'd say is B, and then maybe the A's would be a triangle or something. Instead of writing the letter A, you can do that, and then make sure you have a key. And then C might be open circles or something. Let's see. Okay, so some of my students did this. I might actually do this as a bar graph, which is weird because time really is continuous. But since I only checked with two, uh, since I only had two times, I really don't know what's happening in the middle. So this is kind of an exception to the whole, you know, put in some dots for continuous, um, for con continuous uh, independent variables and then draw your line. I, I mean, I, I marked this right. I went with this. If it was a bar, I thought it was okay too because there's really only two times given. So for continuous stuff, you're gonna expect to have a few more um, data points, you know? Um, so anyway, if you see two independent variables, pick which one you want for your x-axis. And um, I do prefer this top one because I think you can compare the times for culture A. I think it's easier visually to see the times for culture B and the times for culture C. Um, I don't think the other one is bad. I actually didn't take points off for that. But I do think it doesn't really fit perfectly with what a line graph should be because there's only two data points for each category. I mean, for each, like, um, you know, for each culture. So if you wanted instead to plot cytochrome produced like none C and B as your categories here instead of your culture, I mean, I think that would be fine too. Okay. All right. Um, last thing to talk about are um, semi-log and log scales. So normally when you plot data, um, it goes something like, uh, it goes up, like if this is zero, oops, if this is zero, and that's 10,000, that'd be 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. That's a normal graph, right? You're going up by some number, even if that number is 10,000 for each, um, each like hop up, right? Look over on the x-axis. We're starting at, I guess, probably pretty close to zero. And then we're going to 0.1, and then one, and then 10, and then 100, and then 1,000. This is a log scale, um, this side. So because this is not log on the y and it is log on the x, um, it's a semi-log scale, or it could be flipped the other way too. It's a semi-log if one of them is um, in a log scale. So you're going to use this whenever your data spans several orders of magnitude, meaning you have a bunch of dots down here, and there's really a tiny little difference between here and here, right? And here and here. Um, if you plotted this on a regular scale, the difference between 0.1 and 1 would be like absolutely minuscule because you have numbers that are up here in the thousands, right? Over here. So if you have um, data that spans several orders of magnitude from 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000, that's an order of magnitude, you're adding a zero on each time, um, you're going to want to use a log scale or a semi-log scale. This also shows differences at the tiny, uh, minute scale that you might not see otherwise. So you can use it to distinguish between differences in smaller values. So we'll see this in class when we um, when we do the lab where we're um, taking DNA and we'll cut it with restriction enzymes so you'll have different fragments or little pieces of DNA. Then we'll pull it through a gel and the little pieces go faster than the big pieces. And so we'll plot this on semi-log paper. And this time, these distances are uh, regular, just linear. You're going up from 0 to 5 to 10 to 15, just going up by 5 each time. So this is like the normal scale. But this one goes from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. So we're adding a zero. Um, that's a logarithmic increase. And so when you plot um, 
the distance that a DNA fragment travels, like from here to here, the littler ones actually um, would be here, the bigger ones would be here. Um, that corresponds to changes in base pairs that are like really, really, really big. So like if, um, if it traveled 25 uh, millimeters, then it's probably about, let's see, right here would be between 1,000 and 2,000. I don't know, maybe it's like, I don't know, 1,600 or something, right? But if it only traveled 10 millimeters, well, that would be really huge. It would be a, a really, really big fragment, maybe more than 100,000. Okay, here is um, my last example, I think, for for this unit. So this is an, or for this uh, video. This is an example of um, a graph and a data table that was on an AP bio test. Um, so plant or plant part is over here on the X axis. So that's what we know already. We know they're gonna look at flowers, immature seeds, mature seeds, and seedlings. So as a plant goes through development, they have flowers and the flowers get pollinated and then they produce seeds and the seeds mature and then they fall to the ground and hopefully seedlings will grow from there. And then this is, it's kind of cut off, but it says density. So number per, I don't know, per something, I guess, numbers per meter squared. Um, so we start with a whole lot of flowers, and then we have fewer immature seeds and even fewer mature seeds and even fewer seedlings. We're looking at water only versus insecticide. So uh, get out of the way here. So uh, you can see um, that if you spray with the insecticide, we actually have more um, of the of the seedlings uh, make it, whereas if you um, only give them water, um, not as many seedlings make it. So this insecticide must be killing um, insects or bugs that eat the plants probably or do something bad to the plants. So they didn't want you to graph it all. So here's the, the data table that shows you the same thing. Um, and they didn't want you to graph it all there. The first question um, is a student incorrectly plots one value from the table on the graph. Um, identify the error in the student conducted graph. So this is actually saving you time. Instead of you plotting the whole thing, they plot it, but they say there's one mistake. And so the mistake to notice, they want to see if you understand this semi-log um, graph. So this is the mistake because if you look over here, the immature seeds with water, that would be the, the water is the open box. This should be 2,440. And if you look over here, this is less than 1,000, right? So it's this po point right here that is plotted incorrectly. Um, and then it says provide reasoning to support the student's choice of a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. Notice that we have 8,000 something flowers and then only 60 mature seeds. So that's down two orders of magnitude. And then only one seedling, which is down another order of magnitude. So anytime you have data that spans several orders of magnitude from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 and so on, um, you can use a logarithmic scale. Um, so what they wanted here, the answers that they were going to accept or the reasoning would be if your data spans several orders of magnitude, they would accept that for the point. You could also say it enables the, dis the display of all the data on one graph. Um, otherwise, you'd have a graph that would go up to 10,000 and you'd be like if you went from on a regular linear scale, you wouldn't even see like the difference between um, you know, one and 10 very well at all. The differences right here would look like nothing, but the differences are important um, from having like, uh, I don't know, 60 seeds down to one seedling. That's kind of important, I think. Um, so that enables the display of all the data on one graph. And um, that brings us to this part also. You could write, it, you visually, you couldn't visually distinguish between the differences in the smaller values if they were plotted on a lot on a regular scale. So if you had a linear scale and you tried to plot um, these numbers, you wouldn't even see a difference in here because this number is just so big. So that's what semi-log um, is, is for. Okay, that is it for graphs. Um, next time we'll go back to some more experimental design.